For the first time, the British punk rocker Viv Albertine saw a photo of Patti Smith. She thought, I have never seen a girl who looks like this. She is my soul made visible. Everything I hold deep inside myself that I won't let out. I'm so excited I feel sick. She was 20. A year later, the New York poet and writer Sharon Mesmer read a profile of Patti Smith in 16 magazine. She said, I, I, I dug the way she looked, weird, scraggly hair, untweezed eyebrows, a haunted, intense effect. Mesmer was 16, and she said, here was Patti Smith, unpretty, flat-chested, like me. And finding a skinny, unpretty girl rock star was a pretty big deal. She read that Patti Smith favored funky old jeans and t-shirts, and so the next week she found a new world of personal style at Army-Navy stores and thrift shops. After all, what could a young girl do if she wanted to sing for a rock and roll band? The question only arose in the mid-70s when a new category of girl, that's Mesmer's phrase, arose from a combination of the women's movement and rock and roll. Author and critic Luke Sante was equally mesmerized by Patti Smith the first time he saw her live. Who had dreamed of such a figure, an androgynous punk chanteuse? She was both entirely new, he wrote, and yet somehow well anticipated. Seeing her for me was an epiphany at 19. So many of us have this kind of experience in adolescence, at least upon reflection. What do we call this kind of pop cultural epiphany? It is an essential moment in the experience of cool. Now, many people discuss cool as if it is superficial and related to consumerism. I'm going to talk about why cool matters. In a given generation, iconic figures emerge out of popular culture who embody new strategies of individuality for that given generation. When the person arrives, we invoke the term, that's cool, he's so cool, or just cool. A state of attention or fandom or obsession may begin. When James Dean first appeared on screen in the mid-1950s, he was the first teenager in Hollywood film history. So American teenagers flocked to see themselves represented in his tormented yearnings, his romantic brooding, his attempts to do the right thing. Icons of cool are cultural guides. John Leonard captured his own pop cultural epiphany in just five words. Before Elvis, there was nothing. Now what did he mean? Well, Lon and, Lon, excuse me, John Lennon was a rebel and class clown in post-war industrial Liverpool, a fairly bleak place. And when he saw Elvis, he intuited here was an artistic vision that was a new vision of music, style, self, the future. No one born after 1950 understands Elvis the same way that generation did. At such times, the social fabric has been breached, your old self is as good as dead, and the future is unwritten, as Joe Strummer used to say. Last year, I curated a photography and popular culture exhibit at the National Portrait Gallery of the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. We chose 100 photographs and 100 icons to represent American Cool, the name of the exhibit. We chose them based on a person who was an icon of cool had to have created an original artistic vision at first seen as rebellious or transgressive, but that later became a permanent mainstream legacy. The person also had to have a signature style, and by signature, I mean it had to be inseparable from that person's experience. So it could be an athlete like Muhammad Ali, or an actor like Jack Nicholson, or a singer like Billie Holiday, or a comedian like Lenny Bruce or Richard Pryor. Cool is not synonymous with celebrity or talent. Cool is rebellion with critical intent and social import. And so, an initial definition. Cool is the process by which iconic rebels carve out new cultural space for a given generation. Now, Patti Smith understood this process well. Her music embodied a social critique. I didn't want to be a girl, she wrote, because the behavioral parameters for, for women were so limited in the late 1960s. So she brought together beat poetry, raw vocal power, punk attitude, androgynous style, and the gravitas of a pagan goddess, all within a great rock and roll band that is, by the way, still together. In Just Kids, she reflected on her relationship with Robert Maplethorpe when they were young, aspiring artists. She wrote, I was a bad girl trying to be good, and he was a good boy trying to be bad. Cool lies along this line, where outdated morality and social convention meets the rebel's example for a given generation. So where does cool come from? 
Cole begins with one artist's response to a, to a core dilemma in American life. The modern usage of cool comes into the language from 1940s African-American jazz culture. At the time, to be cool meant to have your emotions under control in a stylish, detached manner, to be cool. The only people who used the term were jazz musicians, jazz fans, and a couple of bohemians. But jazz was the dominant subculture of post-war American life, particularly in New York. And so it was crossed over by authors like Jack Kerouac and, and Norman Mailer, and even Leonard Bernstein, who in West Side Story wrote a production number called Cool, sung by a character named Ice, in case you didn't get it. <laughs> what is amazing is that one man is responsible for bringing cool into American culture, and it's the legendary saxophonist Lester Young. And Lester Young was a brilliant improviser with an original sound that was coolly melodic and lyrical. It was the sound of a bluesy, urbane romanticism. Yet Lester Young would not conform to the major racial convention of the time. He would not smile on stage. At the time, blacks had to smile on stage, or in fact, in any employment situation. It was called Uncle Tomming, and if you didn't do it, you got fired, or worse. Lester Young was a shy, sensitive artist, so he created a more subtle form of rebellion through an aesthetics of detachment. First of all, when Lester Young said, I'm cool, he meant I'm calm and relaxed in this place, in my own style. It came to mean a certain confident composure, especially in public. It was a mode of calm defiance against racism. And it's also a precedent for our more recent term, chill. To project cool, he created a few distinctive stylistic gestures. He held his saxophone out at a 45 degree angle to be more distinctive on stage. He wore a uniquely crafted pork pie hat like a crown. He spoke jazz slang in a poetic manner and created a personal jargon so impenetrable that his manager once said, I didn't understand anything Lester said to me for the first three months I knew him. <laughs> he coined creative phrases that remain in jazz lore today. To want something was to have big eyes for it, and to express disapproval was to have no eyes for it. If there was a racist around, he would say, I feel a draft, and, and mime dusting off his shoulder. He gave Billie Holiday her nickname, Lady Day, and they were musical soulmates. But most importantly, Lester Young was the first performer to wear sunglasses on stage in performance, and then later, even at night, in clubs. Now, shades have always been associated with cool. Why? Because when you put on sunglasses, you are instantly more mysterious, interesting, and relaxed. What happens is that it's the opposite of the saying that the eyes are the windows to the soul. Suddenly, the windows are shut, the flow of information is stopped, and you are less vulnerable. So shades create an instant mask of cool. This was immediately influential among jazz musicians, and actually it's still true today. Uh, they began wearing sunglasses day and night, on stage and off, inside and outside. So by 1957, cool looked like this. This is the cover of Nuke's Time, Sonny Rollins' album from 1957. And at this time, a young black journalist named George Goodman always thought of Sonny Rollins as Mr. Cool, thought of these musicians as his generation's cultural revolutionaries, and defined this post-war black cool in five words. Cool was defiance with dignity. Now, the key icon of this period was Miles Davis. And this is the same year. It's 1957. You can see he's got shades on. He's in the recording studio. He's stylish, poised, cerebral, relaxed, yet kind of intense, and seemingly unaware of the camera. A few years after this, in a Playboy interview, Miles Davis invoked the term Uncle Tomming four times as the mode of behavior he most detested. He said, white people want to see black musicians, quote, not only play their instrument, but entertain them with grinning and dancing. Jazz musicians replaced Uncle Tomming and its grinning and dancing with mystery, detachment, and an aloof stare. Last year, Questlove, the drummer and band leader for The Roots, reflected back on the importance of this moment. He wrote, Jazz musicians forced the mainstream to see black musicians as virtuosos with complex ideas and powerful emotions. How are you going to treat someone as less than human once they've been so deeply human in full view? Lester Young's subtle rebellion made this kind of reassessment possible. Now, a distinctively African-American cool still operates in music and style, 
For example, in hip hop. A few years back, Ebony Magazine did a cover story called The Genius of Cool, the 25 coolest brothers in history, of all time, actually, I think it's called. And they traced the tradition from someone like Miles Davis to someone like Marvin Gaye to Jay-Z. So cool was originally an African-American concept developed by jazz musicians at a time when black music, language, and culture was also influential in rock and roll and soul, among other things, and all during the first upsurge of the civil rights movement. When cool crosses over into more general usage, it is roughly synonymous with stylish, authentic rebellion. But to make the, the idea of rebellion a little more profound, I'm going to match a French existentialist author with Elvis. In 1951, Albert Camus wrote The Rebel, and it was the first historical study of individual rebellion. To rebel was the first act of self-awareness and self-creation. But for rebellion to be important, it had to be public. It had to be enacted against unethical authority and resonate with others. Camus' five-word declaration was this, I rebel, therefore we exist. In other words, my rebellion must create the conditions for yours. We see how this worked with women looking at Patti Smith in the 1970s or black men taking Lester Young as a model in the 1940s. Or let's take Johnny Cash, whose music was also an embodied social critique, the how and why of being the man in black. In that song, Johnny Cash sings, I wear the black for the poor and beaten down living in the hungry, hopeless part of town. I wear the black and mourning for lives that could have been. Until we have a better society, since at the end, I will have to carry off a little darkness on my back. So rebellion is only important if it has an objective of a better society, or else it's just private griping or the fantasy of sticking it to the man. I rebel, therefore we exist. A new community, a new generation, a new artistic cohort. So I want to show how cool works as a form of rebellion by returning to the example of Elvis. Elvis was a great singer in an African-American vocal tradition. Now the proof of this is that Elvis had a series of hits on Billboard's rhythm and blues charts in the mid-1950s, the black charts as they were known. When he lived in Memphis, he was encouraged by bluesmen B.B. King and Bobby Boubland. He admired the vocal styles of Fats Domino, in particular Arthur Crudup, who wrote his first hit, That's All Right Mama. He shopped at Mr. B's on Beale Street, the premier store of black fashion. He took from the tradition its interpretive ability, its style and stagecraft, its sexual rhetoric and stage moves. But Elvis's vocal synthesis was all his own. He added elements of country music both vocally and rhythmically, and he adapted the, the melodic phrasing of two of his favorite singers, Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. And yet Elvis's music was at first condemned as vulgar, degenerate, vapid, and regressive. People feared sexualized teenage girls and interracial dancing. In 1956, up in New York, a then 15-year-old Paul Simon first heard Elvis on the radio show live from the Louisiana Hayride. He recalled, the announcer said, when this guy comes out on stage in the South, all the girls scream and rush the stage. He started singing That's All Right Mama. I could have sworn he was a black guy. Simon was enthralled. He wrote, Quote, I grew my hair like him, I imitated his stage act, once I ran all around town to find a lavender shirt like he wore on one of his albums. Now, Paul Simon's 60s folk rock at the time may seem to have very little in common with Elvis' music, but that misses the point. Elvis was the rupture in the social fabric. The same year, then 15-year-old Bob Dylan set Elvis' example at an even higher pitch. When I first heard Elvis' voice, I knew I wasn't going to work for anybody and nobody was going to be my boss. Hearing him for the first time was like busting out of jail. So Dylan's old self suddenly felt like a prison. To respond to Elvis's call would require a newly built self. Also, our icons of cool don't work nine to five in offices or factories. Cool does not have a boss. <laughs> so if we take John Lennon's testimony and add it to Paul Simon's and Bob Dylan's, here are three aspiring teenage musicians and songwriters all destined to become cultural rebels and leaders of the next generation, all galvanized by a new musical idiom and by one original artist. Elvis rebelled, and they now existed. Now, for the past generation, the media has inflected cool towards celebrity, fame, wealth, and marketing. 
and away from figures or ideas of cultural rebellion. Our critics care more about the cool hunt for new products than they do about our avatars of cool. Can there be a 21st century revitalized cool? I don't know yet, but I have been encouraged by a few recent media events in which celebrities were awestruck by cool, and therein lies the difference. At the Golden Globes, Prince came out to present an award. Pretty sure it was the first time. And jaws dropped around the room. Celebrities jumped up to shout their joy. You could see actress Allison Janney and others mouth the words, is that really Prince? And when Missy Elliott commandeered the Super Bowl halftime show with her fierce feminist hip hop after a long absence, celebrities from Anderson Cooper to Justin Timberlake tweeted their love. CNN declared that Missy Elliott won the internet on Super Bowl Sunday. I'm fairly sure she's the first non-athlete to do so. <laughs> cool, someone cool is not a role model or a hero or a saint. Cool is wilder and more original. So I think it's time to share my own experience. In the summer of 1975, I was listening to WNEW FM up in New York, and the DJ came on to announce a brand new single, Born to Run, by someone named Bruce Springsteen. I was transfixed for the next three minutes. I stood there with my hand on the speaker. It was like my angst made manifest over a muddy, propulsive musical engine. And his voice had this ache for freedom. And when I saw his exuberant live shows, I aspired to this artistic path of liberation. The album Born to Run changed my life the way an artwork can change your life. I listened to that record every day. I knew every word. I sang it on the streets out loud on a fairly regular basis. <laughs> and actually in bars, too. Um, it was like possession in the primal or primitive sense, because I sang it in Bruce's voice. I needed to get where he was. In a way, cool is an unasked question. How do I get where you are? Because that's where I need to go. So I didn't want to be Springsteen. I wanted to find my own key to get out of jail get out of my own jail. I worked through his example to find my own voice. So why does cool matter? In adolescence, cool stands for the process by which we negotiate identity in modernity through figures of popular culture. And any American child can become American cool. Jay-Z is from the Marcy Housing Projects in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn. Madonna is a working class Italian American from Detroit. Johnny Depp from a, from a rootless Southern family. Jennifer Lawrence from suburban Louisville. Most of our icons of cool come from working class or middle class backgrounds. Each one built a mythic persona out of scratch, talent, hard work, style, and otherworldly self-possession and self-confidence. Cool is an outlaw sensibility for a consumer society. Now, an outlaw breaks the law to make a point. So what's your rebellion for? Hopefully, it's for others. Thanks for listening.